So I was first diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was 28. So I ended up, fin I did 12 total treatments, so six cycles. So I ended up finishing IVD. It was pretty, you know, very, it was fine, you know, as chemo could be. I rang the bell. I had like a unicorn onesie on, a purple wig, like, yeah, let's go be behind me. Yeah, great. I just, I didn't want to be a cancer patient anymore. I wanted to be healthy, go on with my life. He just basically said, see ya in three months. And then I had another scan, which is where it showed that it was growing. It was a weird time for me. I was like working. So I was working, but I had taken a step back. But I felt, so a lot of my identity has been tied to like um, working and like what my career is. I think a lot of us at, our, at this like generation is a lot like that. So I felt less than that I had to take this less job when I had worked so hard to get the other job. And so right around the time that I realized I was sick again, I was about to apply back again to go to the higher job that was very stressful. So it was like really weird. It was like, I had to call that guy and say, hey, either I have cancer or I don't. If I don't, I'll be there. If I do, I don't know. So when I actually got the diagnosis, I like, it was like reality slapped me in the face. Honestly, I was like, whoa, like this isn't, holy cow. Like you can't, I'm not just packing it back in the recesses of my head. Like I got cancer again. And I'll never forget having to go tell my daughter that I had cancer again. Like I didn't know how to do that because I feel like so much of her life was already, so much of my family's life had been disrupted because of my cancer. And I know that that's not my fault. I didn't ask for cancer, but you can't help but feel like, oh my God, like I have to take, put this on my husband again, put this on my mom, put this on my daughter, put this on everyone. And just feeling like, whoa, like this is the first time I thought, whoa, maybe I'm not going to make it. Like, I really don't think I'm going to make it. And so I just felt alone, really lonely. There, were, I didn't have any cancer friends. I never seen another young person really at the cancer center. I didn't have anyone to talk to about the way that it felt to relapse. And you know, in another weird way, which I kind of tell people that this is a normal way to feel when you relapse is like, you know, when you have cancer and you get in remission, there's always like a little, per, little like cancer monster watching you like, oh, I could come back anytime. I, I might come back, you know, I, I might be back, you know, in your head. And so when I relapsed, it was like a weird feeling of like, okay, I can stop watching my back now. The monster already caught me. And so I really just like, that's how I started sharing online. I had a YouTube channel a long time ago. It was nothing to do with cancer. But I remember I just like went and parked in the TJ Maxx parking lot near my house. And I turned on the camera and I just said, hey, so um, it's been like five years since I've ever posted anything on here, but I have cancer. And I started sharing my story of the things that have happened. And I just started documenting, like when my hair started falling out, I, I pulled it out on camera and I showed people what it looked like because your hair and the way that you look doesn't define your worth as a person, um, whether or not you're beautiful and my hair will grow back. So, oh my God, I'm like looking in the mirror. I couldn't find those things. And I thought that if I, if I don't make it, at, at least there could be something that is for somebody else out there to help them and not feel like I've felt this whole time. Finding a community that can validate the way that you feel if it's not. So I felt very pressured to be the cancer patient that you see in the media. So a walk to remember or whatever other cancer movie, like a very put together, brave, strong person like that's what everyone says and you know I've had people tell me you know when I was just going through chemo you're such an inspiration and I always wanted to say what am I inspiring you to do not die because that's what I'm just trying to do and now I know people mean well but I think that it's important to say like even if people mean well you still can be saying the wrong thing because when you kind of put this pressure on people especially younger people who are very like goal-oriented or type A or whatever, just very similar to me, like very career-driven, very driven person in general. I was like, okay, well, I'm driven to be all these things you're saying. There's no space for me to be authentic. 
And I think I just want to tell people that no matter what age you are, the feelings that you have are valid. They are authentic. People stop being your friend just because you have cancer and it's not because of you. And this happens a lot across almost the whole cancer community, but nobody ever wants to talk about it because it feels like shameful. You feel like what I, I was like, what did I do? All I did was get sick. And you guys just walked away from me. And especially when I relapsed, I felt like everyone was sick of hearing about me being sick. And it's like, who do you think is the most sick of me being sick? It's me. <laughs> so I just think it's important to, as a caregiver or as a loved one of somebody, leave space for authenticity and for hard things. And even if you don't know what to say, you can listen. And you don't need to say, it's a, oh, you got this, or everything happens for a reason. It doesn't help anything. Say, this sucks. I love you, and this really sucks. That is, I I wish I could have heard that at some point, because I would have just felt so validated. So if I could go back to, like, who I was in the beginning, I would say there's a couple of things. Number one, I tell people to uh, protect your information. You don't owe everyone in the world a news report about your cancer you don't owe anyone anything so it's very overwhelming when you get diagnosed you have people like sally from first grade who you haven't talked to in like 10 years coming by to say oh what's going on and asking and i thought because somebody asked me i had to reply because that's the polite thing to do well it's not really the time to be worrying about everyone else. It's the time to be worrying about you and how you're going to get through this and how you and your family are going to get through this. So like that, protecting it. And then also not having to always put on a brave face. And I'm hopeful that people in your life will give you space to be happy, sad, whatever. Um, next, also advocating for yourself, trusting your gut, if something doesn't feel right, I don't care if this guy has a thousand accolades or this woman, you are allowed to go ask for a second opinion. It's not offensive. It shouldn't be hurting their feelings. And if they have a problem with that, that was number one right there. Get out of there. Also, just don't forget that you're still you. I think a lot of our identity can become cancer. And and don't get me wrong, you do change. Like I'm a completely probably different person than I was before cancer. But, and I always thought, like I always framed it this way, like, the person who I was died the day I had cancer, like I found out I had cancer and this new person came, but I thought I read something about trauma recently. And so I like to reframe this because I know I've said that before. So I like to reframe it that, yes, that person isn't there anymore, but that person isn't gone forever. There's pieces of that person you can go back to and pick them up off the shelf once you're through all of this and say, hey, sort through it and go, hey, what did I like about my life before? Did I like working 80 hours a week. Nah, get rid of that one. Did I like, you know, drawing and painting? Yeah. Like, let's look at that more and live for yourself. Like truly life is too freaking short. Like there's no other way to put it. Make yourself happy. Focus on your family. Do what you always wanted to do. And then also, even if you have cancer and you're, you're listening to this and it's never going to go away and it's everything is doom and gloom, you no, no you still can dream be, do, make, write the next great novel. It doesn't even matter from your hospital bed. Do whatever you want. And also, if you just want to lay there and watch Price is Right every single day, do it. Because you, the way you cope with cancer is the way you cope with cancer. And that's valid.